Hi, my name is Patrick. I'm a co-founder and the founding CEO of Rotten Tomatoes. And today I'm going to talk about focus. My story began last summer. I was volunteering as the entrepreneur in residence at Blue Startups, a tech accelerator in Hawaii. There I worked with seven different startups daily over a period of three months. And the advice I gave to each of them over and over again was that they were all trying to do too much, that they needed to focus. Over the course of hammering that point in, I realized that I had not followed my own advice, that I had not been focused with my last few startups. I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've started six companies, of which Rotten Tomatoes was the third. The companies where I was focused worked. The ones where I was not focused failed. And when I looked around at every successful company I could think of, every one of them started off focused. And that's when I realized that being focused is the most important trait for a startup to have. Ironically, almost everyone gets this wrong, and it's why so few startups make it. But why do so many entrepreneurs make this mistake? Entrepreneurs believe they can do anything, so they want to do everything. It's actually harder and against their nature to focus. Too many features, too many categories, too many markets. They want to be everything for everybody. You can spot the worst offenders a mile away by looking at their deck. They have a competitive landscape slide. On one axis, they have their company and their competitors listed. On the other axis, they have a list of features. Each competitor has a few features checked off. And for their company, they have a line of checks all the way down. I'm sure a bunch of you have this exact slide in your deck right now. These entrepreneurs are building everything but the kitchen sink and trying to service everybody. This is the most common problem entrepreneurs face by far. They are not focused. So what is focus? Focus is answering one question as quickly and cheaply as possible. Do people want this? The goal is to get to product market fit, which I define to be when a product is so good that people tell other people about it without being asked to. In other words, the product sells itself. Think early seasons of Game of Thrones or the Netflix show Tiger King or the musical Hamilton. With Rotten Tomatoes, for example, we saw early signs of product market fit when, one, the site was featured on Netscape and Yahoo. Two, Roger Ebert listed Rotten Tomatoes as one of his favorite movie websites in a magazine article he wrote. And three, we saw a spike in traffic the day Pixar released A Bug's Life, and it turned out that that traffic was coming from Pixar. People wanted our product. And because of these early signs, we went out and raised money to run Rotten Tomatoes as a real company. I like to think of starting, finding product market fit as trying to start a fire. Being everything for everybody is like sunlight hitting the earth. It provides light and heat, but isn't enough to start a fire. But what happens when you add a magnifying glass? By focusing the sun's rays to a single tiny point, it is possible to start a fire. Now, imagine your resources as a sunlight. By focusing your resources on a tiny point, it is possible to find product market fit. And one important thing to remember about fire it spreads. If everything falls into place just right, you could end up with a forest fire. That's Facebook, Amazon, Google. Their fires are so big, you couldn't put them out even if you wanted to. So how do you focus your resources? You reduce scope, cut away until it's one feature, one category, one market. This is the opposite of building everything but the kitchen sink. For feature, pick the feature that is the main reason why anyone would use your product. For Rotten Tomatoes, that's the tomato meter. You can get rid of everything else on the site and it's still 95% works. For Twitter, that's the tweet. Category, choose the category that makes the most sense for your business. For Rotten Tomatoes, that was movies. Market, go for the lowest hanging fruit. The smaller and more niche the market, 
the better. For Rotten Tomatoes, we initially started with hardcore movie buffs. At the start, entrepreneurs generally have extremely limited resources. So reducing the scope of the problem increases the chance of success. Not only does it allow you to do things faster and cheaper, it ends up being a better product too. One way to tell if you've cut enough is to see if you can explain your product in 15 seconds. If it takes five minutes to explain, it's too complicated. For example, Rotten Tomatoes is a site for movie reviews and news. We aggregate reviews from professional critics in one place and then give you a score based on the percentage of critics that recommend seeing the movie. A product that you can explain will spread. A product you can't explain won't. Before Ron Tomatoes, I had a design firm called Design Reactor. We provided web design, 3D design, and print design services for any type of client. We were super unfocused. However, we quickly realized that 3D took way too long to render and print took too long to wait for color proofs. So we focused our services down to just web design. And after we landed a contract with Disney Channel, we focused our market down to just entertainment. Once we were web design for the entertainment industry, everything fell into place. Our portfolio made sense. We were able to charge much more and we never had a cold call again. And the money we raised for Rotten Tomatoes, it came from the clients we had from our design firm. The best products and best companies do primarily one thing at the start. Think Rotten Tomatoes, Instagram, Snapchat, YouTube, Twitch, Twitter. You can't be more of a single thing than Twitter. It's literally a status update. Amazon started with just books. They went public just selling books. It wasn't until the second year of being public that they launched into a second category. eBay started with Beanie Babies. Google was just simple search. When Google started, Yahoo was huge, but Yahoo was a portal. In other words, they were everything but the kitchen sink. Yahoo had unlimited resources, Google, was a pair of PhD students right out of Stanford. Yet Yahoo was beaten by Google at the one thing that Yahoo should have been good at, search. But even Google Video, with all the resources of Google behind it, couldn't beat YouTube. And instead, Google was forced to buy YouTube. Same with Facebook, buying Instagram, and Amazon, buying Zappos. In every case, the larger company with infinitely more resources could not compete with a smaller, focused startup. Going back to that competitive landscape slide I talked about earlier, instead of having a line of checks all the way down for features, you should have one check for a single feature and do that one thing better than anyone else. That was Google for search, YouTube for video, Instagram for photos, Zappos for shoes, Rotten Tomatoes for movie reviews. As Peter Thiel says in his book, Zero to One, start small and monopolize. Every startup is small at the start. Every monopoly dominates a large share of its market. Therefore, every startup should start with a very small market. Always err on the side of starting too small. The reason is simple. It's easier to dominate a small market than a large one. If you think your initial market might be too big, it almost certainly is. Look at Facebook. The temptation for most people would have been to launch to all schools at once. Instead, Facebook launched just in Harvard. Within 24 hours of launching, 1,200 students had signed up. Within a month, over half the undergraduate population was registered on the site. Facebook monopolized Harvard and then slowly and systematically added schools and later countries until their monopoly grew to cover the entire world. The goal is to get a monopoly. Going by Peter's advice, shrink the market to the point where this is possible. For example, if you reduce your, your market to just yourself and you use your own product, you would have 100% market share. By focusing on one school, Harvard, Facebook had a monopoly within a month. If they launched to all schools, in the same amount of time, 
they'd likely have more students overall using their service, but it'd be very unlikely they would have a monopoly of all schools in that same time frame. Why is this important? When you have 1% of the market, the other 99% has never heard of you. When you have 10%, some of the other 90% has heard of you and it's easier to sell or sign them up as a result. When you have 50%, everyone's heard of you. And at that point, you'll find that your market share will continue growing by itself. I recommend to reduce your market to the point where you have a realistic shot of capturing over 50% of that market in one year. Start with a tiny market and monopolize it. Regardless of how focused you are, you can't start a fire until you actually launch something. Do what you can with the resources that you have to get something out there. Don't worry about resources that you don't have. Otherwise, you'll get stuck. Without money, you're stuck trying to fundraise. Without tech people, you're stuck trying to hire an engineer or find a technical co-founder. Rotten Tomatoes went from idea to launch in two weeks by one person, our creative director at Design Reactor, Sen Duong. Sen was not a coder, so he built the website using static HTML. Twitter was born out of a hackathon and built in one month with a minimal team. Facebook was built by one person, Mark Zuckerberg, in a few weeks. And FaceMash, an early prototype of Facebook, was built in one night. To launch quickly, you should release a minimum viable product. A minimum viable product is a product with enough features to validate an idea early in the development cycle. This is the equivalent of drawing blueprints before building a house. It's a lot easier to move a room around when you're working with blueprints than after you've built a house. There are several approaches to putting out a minimum viable product. Customer interviews. You can actually validate a product idea just by talking to customers you think are the most likely to use your product. Landing page. Make a landing page for your idea, buy Facebook ads, and see if people sign up to get notified when your product launches. Kickstarter. What's great about Kickstarter isn't just that you can raise money from the platform, it's that you can validate your product idea before actually building the product. Do it manually. Craigslist and AngelList have lists in their names because they started as mailing lists. It wasn't until they became very popular that they built a platform. Any one of you could launch a mailing list within a day for zero cost, and you could pair that with email and Google Sheets to test and improve your product before ever writing a line of code. Reduce scope and launch as quickly and cheaply as possible. By launching your product, you can see if you're able to start a fire. In other words, try to find product market fit for a tiny initial market. But what happens if it doesn't like? You pivot, change the feature or the category or the market and launch again, or even try something completely different. Things don't always light on the first try. Rotten Tomatoes was my third company. Mark Zuckerberg did multiple startup projects before Facebook. Max Levchin did multiple startup projects before PayPal. YouTube originally tried to be hot or not with video. Justin TV pivoted to Twitch. Odeo pivoted to Twitter. Does focus always work? No. Being focused does not guarantee success, but being unfocused guarantees failure. Look at Juicero, which raised 120 million to over-engineer a product that no one wanted, or Homejoy, which raised 66 million and prematurely scaled before finding a viable business model. Or even the drama around WeWork. What was the first thing they did after they fired their CEO? They cut all their non-core businesses. In other words, they focused. But these examples are all of companies that got big enough to be noticed. The majority of unfocused startups you'll never hear of. They struggle in silence, which leads me to my next point. Stress. Stress goes hand in hand with entrepreneurship. It's natural when it's your own thing. You'll put in 110% and care more about your company than anything. You carry the weight of protecting your employees, investors, clients, 
users, your company's brand, your reputation. The three startups I did after Rotten Tomatoes all failed. Combined, I spent over 14 years of my life and nearly seven million in funding. Looking back, my success with Rotten Tomatoes made me try to do too much. I was unfocused. And as a result, all three times, I was unable to start a fire. The stress I endured during that time led to mental, physical, and emotional problems. I was suffering from insomnia, shortness of breath, even full body rashes, all due to stress. There have been startup founders that have committed suicide, all due to stress. Stress is one of the main reasons why founders start fighting with each other and taking their startups down with them. And why am I talking about stress during a talk about focus? Because the good news is that being focused reduces stress. A huge source of stress is being unfocused and biting off more than you can chew. You get stuck and everything is harder, takes longer, and costs more money. Reducing scope and focusing makes things easier, faster, and cheaper, which leads to less stress and better mental, physical, and emotional health. It's better for you and it's better for your company. I'll end with a quote from Steve Jobs. People think focus means saying yes to the thing you've got to focus on, but that's not what it means at all. It means saying no to the hundred other good ideas that there are. You have to pick carefully. Don't say yes to a hundred things and end up being unfocused. Take that magnifying glass and focus all your resources to a single tiny point. One feature, one category, one market. Now get out there and start some fires. Thank you.